Two Western diplomats and an Iranian official said the talks would likely take a pause on Thursday, but it's unclear if talks would resume before Iran's June the 18th presidential election. Well, to highlight some likely impact of the decision of OPEC Plus is Babajide Atolagbe, investment risk analyst with Afrinvest Asset Management. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Babajide. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so OPEC Plus decision was uh, the projection of a lot of analysts. So this shouldn't come as a surprise. And this follows increases in May and June. This would amount to a total rise of 2 million barrels a day over the period. Which way do you see the market swinging after this decision? And bringing it back home to Nigeria, what should we expect? Um, for the oil market, um, you know, the oil market is currently um, in the bullish phase as we speak. With price, you know, hovering around sixty-five dollar to seventy dollar per barrel, and this is um, in a positive sentiment, which is largely backed by um, economic fundamentals. And um, practically, um, twenty twenty-one has been um, a decent year um, in terms of economic recovery, and this is due to um, improved vaccination exercise as well as some um, reopening of economic um, activities. So this has kind of forced um, critical sectors such as transportation, uh, manufacturing, aviation, and a couple of others um, you know, that revived activities in that sectors. And these sectors are basically um, energy driven. And you know, looking at um, data from the likes of um, international um, agency, international energy agency and OPEC, um, they've showed us that um, oil demand has actually improved um, you know, materially over the last couple of months. And then the output for oil um, demand is, um, um, is kind of positive in the short to mid term. And you know, also, we need to look at it from the supply um, perspective again, in order for us to be able to um, see where the market is heading to. Um, you know, production cut by OPEC countries um, you know, has supported the market over, over, over time. And currently, we are beginning to see um, you know, countries um, improve their production output. And this is as planned um, um, by OPEC countries. And this is due to, um, you know, um, in order to meet up with um, rising demand. So um, that has been the major um, sentiment driving um, the oil market um, list and lately. But well, you know, going forward, some people, um, some analysts um, believe that um, Brent may eventually eat eighty dollar per barrel um, sometime in the year, and this is where um, our own um, intelligence um, comes in. So we believe that um, the downside risk factors, which I will speak on shortly, um, may not um, make us um, see um, a lasting and um, bullish effect um, in, in the market. And the okay. first is um, you know, that um, supply is um, relatively um, um, pressured. Like you mentioned, um, Iran might be coming back to the market anytime soon. And that would also mean that uh, we might be having excess oil in the market again, and then with that balance, may, may, we may lose that balance. Also, on um, the likes of U.S. shale producers are also um, um, people that we should also keep our, our taps on because you know producing oil in that space is kind of cheap, and then there is currently an incentive to produce more, given the fact that prices are relatively doing um, well. So, on the supply side, there are a lot of factors that okay. are likely to pressure um, demand um, in the short term. All right. So, uh, Mr. Atolagbe, the, the group has flagged, you know, rising COVID-19 infections in India and Japan as uh, one of the reasons uh, for their uh, caution and also uh, Iran's uh, possible su supply back to the market. Uh, can you give us uh, the likely scenarios from this? For the case of um, India and Japan, um, you know, these guys are industrial nations and, you know, um, they depend largely on energy in order to drive um, their industrialization process. And, and it is um, kind of what you have noted that these guys also um, control a um, significant um, chunk in terms of, of energy demand. And given the fact that um, you know, there's a new COVID-19, there's a COVID-19 variant in that space, which may actually affect um, you know, the reopening of economic activities. And that would also um, affect uh, oil demand from these countries. So um, it, is, um, it, it makes sense for, um, for, for OPEC Plus to also consider that in their um, decisions um, um, for, for, for cutting production. And for the case of Iran, you know, Iran is a big player in terms of supply. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why um, we believe that prices have been reasonably um, stable over the years is because um, Iran has not been participating um, at the official market. But sooner or later, once they're able to complete their deal with the um, United States of America, um, um, they might be returning back to the market. And that might, you know, um, give, um, you know set some sort of um, supply um, glut to the market and you might have um, you know, an imbalanced market once more. And the prices would largely suffer from that action. 
Okay, so the Nigerian <coughs> National Petroleum Corporation has announced plans to acquire six in six private refineries across the country. So it's not just about uh, Dangote oil refinery. And there seems to be a lot of criticism about this, even though it seems to be a common practice in other parts of the world. What's your take on this uh, plan? Fort. I mean, the NNPC's involvement in private refinery business is um, a good development. I mean, one of the roles of the agency is to ensure energy security and you know, to stimulate economic growth through partnership and also ensure that you know, the, uh, the resources of the country are best managed in the interest of the people. So essentially, I think one of the best ways of achieving all of this objective is to make, is to make sure that you have um, you know, your skin in the game. And I'm sure a lot of free market enthusiasts may not you know, welcome that development because they believe that once governments begin to involve themselves in some um, particular sector, uh, we not see um, you know, some sort of productivity or efficiency in that sector. But in this case, I think um, that may not be the case here because you know 20% stake is an ideal stake. It doesn't give the government um, you know, um, control in terms of management and influence. However, it just provides them the, uh, the necessary um, presence they require across the value chain of the most important asset of a country. And on the flip side, um, you know, the, the announcement may actually um, discourage new entrants into you know the refinery business because uh, one of the biggest risk factors invest investors are aware of is the political risk and in this case it could be at the form of you know nationalization of private assets and you know the, NAP the NAPC came out to announce that um, it's 20 percent plan uh, 20 percent plan in terms of stake um, you know over the next couple of months years could the, could the bar could the, could the bar be raised to 40 percent could it be raised to 50 percent could it even be raised to majority stake so these are questions that I'm sure investors might you know want to consider before, yeah. you know, um, the yeah. to that sector. I mean, yeah, because a lot of people are saying if the government has uh, how many refineries and talking about rehabilitating the Port Harcourt refinery, we have not even seen the efficiency of this one, then what will they be contributing to the private ones? Um, you're right, because um, at Nigeria as a country, we have um, a couple of refineries that uh, you know, has been um, uh, that, that many um, um, intelligent um, guys and uh, experts are, are considering um, still, you know, given the fact that um, these refineries are not properly um, financed, they're not properly managed, many of them are not even producing at, um, at, uh, at the initial capacity. So that simply tells us that um, the government, um, in a way, has not been able to efficiently manage the resources at their disposal. So and then um, the NBC now coming to um, um, you know buy twenty percent stake in, in private businesses who are committed to you know um, you know driving efficiency um, you know improving productivity so that we Nigerians can have um, you know the best um, result from that uh, space. I might actually raise um, questions and I'm sure investors would not be happy to see um, that um, play out um, positively. Well, um, do I think it's going to be a success? Because uh, um, uh, it depends largely on the commitment of NMPC. Um, first things first is just a plan. And in this country, we've seen a number of plans that have remained plans for a number of years. Mm. And so if the NMC, NMPC is actually an, um, you know, serious and committed, uh, it will be largely implemented. But on the other hand, I believe that um, you know, the um, business owners uh, are the major um, deciders of this particular um, plan. If it is fine by them, they will have it. And if it's not fine by them, it might just be an issue that might you know, linger around for the next couple of you know, months or even years, if I would say. All right, you know, given these developments in the oil space and also with, uh, you know, big oil players moving to uh, greener sources of energy, what's your expectation and outlook uh, in the short term? I mean, in the short term, um, I, I would say expectation is still um, largely bullish because, you know, you know transitioning from, uh, from uh, traditional energy to cleaner energy will take a lot of time, take a lot of investment, and then I believe we still have, um, you know, time to, you know, tap more resources from um, the current um, space. And let me bring it down to Nigeria for proper context. So I think the current um, bullish run in the market will put smiles on the faces of the Nigerian government. I'm sure you agree with me because it gives them the opportunity to, you know, improve oil revenues and also support the FX reserve um, through FX inflows. I remember that um, you know, the oil revenue, um, the 2021 budget was, you know, on the assumption that oil will you know, average $45 um, per barrel for the most of the year. And oil is currently above $70 per barrel. This would mean that this excess revenue, the government will have the flexibility to finance um, unplanned obligations, take on new projects, and also, you know, reduce the fiscal um, deficit. 
So I think um, in the short term, Nigeria is well positioned to enjoy um, you know, the party we are seeing in the oil market. And it is also worthy of note that I mean, we need um, plans and policies to be set in place uh, so that Nigeria can also transition from you know, um, oil energy to the traditional energy into cleaner energy. So when that um, you know, um, transmission happens at the global level, Nigeria will not be you know, um, at the back end um, trying to find their feet. Yeah, but you say Nigeria will be having excess revenue, but also comes uh, extra cost because we're still importing what the refined products that we use. So we need to balance that out. Yes, uh, we need to balance that out. And I, I think it will be uh, more of uh, much revenue because, um, like I mentioned, oil at $45 um, dollar per barrel on the budget and currently at 70 that is an excess. And then let's not forget that um, the CBN had just um, recently um, you know, um, technically devalued the Naira, you know, adopting the NAFEX rate as the official rate. And that would basically imply that, you know, more revenue inflow, given the fact that uh, more Naira inflow in terms of revenue, given the fact that, you know, um, the exchange rate has been um, improved to um, around uh, what's it called, 417 um, Naira to dollar. So basically, I think it's, it's more positive um, or for, for the government and for the people, just to put into proper context, um, it might be a bit of challenge for the people because remember uh, that we are already transitioning into um, you know a no subsidy um, environment, and Nigeria is trying to you know allow um, the market for to determine the prices of of, of 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 fuel, and that might you know you know continue to pressure or put more pressure on local prices because um, as uh, Brent uh, continue to rise, which is a primary um, you know um, commodity, it may affect the pricing of of, of of what you call of energy products such as um, fuel and um, what you call and kerosene and the likes. And the major implication on, on, on the citizen is that that might you know, transist into some sort of you know, inflationary pressures. That might put pressures on, on the local economy and then that might continue to worsen you know, what you call the macroeconomic fund, uh, being, um, fundamentals um, of, of the country. So that, that might be the downside risk to you know, rising oil prices. But on, on, on the general ground, I mean, it's, it's, it's a reason to, um, you know, to smile about for the Nigerian government. All right, Mr. Atolog, before we let you go, let's uh, move to other issues now. The estimated cost of lifting 100 million Nigerians out of poverty in 10 years is put at uh, $1.6 trillion. Can Nigeria afford this, you know, at a time when remittances are actually dwindling? Uh, I mean, um, it may be a bit challenging to actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, be able to take on that kind of responsibility. But I believe that if the government is actually, um, you know, Serious about taking Nigeria out of poverty, if they can prioritize this as a um, uh, as, as, as a major what you call one of your top agenda, I think it can it can it can happen. And you know there are plenty of ways to you know making that happen because you could also um, you know one of the ways you could do it is not necessarily by um, you know uh, by by money. So it, it could be as a result of policies which would make um, you know businesses to thrive and then um, you know improve the standard of living of Nigeria. So, I mean, aside from um, the financial aspect, I think policies and implementation and also, you know, setting the priorities right. And then we all have a common agenda that um, we want to leave Nigeria, we want to leave Nigeria out of poverty over the uh, next couple of, you know, time frame. I think that is um, quite, um, you know, achievable. Dr. Atolagbe, I guess we'll have to uh, leave it there now. Mr. Babajide Atolagbe is investment risk analyst, AFRI Invest Asset Management. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.